Um, I suspect that some of these concepts are going to be very familiar to you and some of them may not be. And I can tell I'm kind of looking around this column for most of the, most of the evening here. So some of the issues are listed here on the bottom. And again, some are well known. I have a whole analogy to a thermos bottle that I think you'll find, uh, find interesting. Methane and carbon dioxide are obviously the two main greenhouse gases besides the water vapor that they were concerned about. Um, the great oxidation event is one of the geologic things that occurred in this planet a long time ago. Um, radiative forcing is one of those odd scientific terms. Uh, forcing is an influence or an effect that tends to change the way the climate works. So a radiative forcing is one that happens to radiation. Um, glacials and interglacials in the ice age, um, the age of bombardment of our planet, which was an exciting time not to have been here. <laughs> Cyanobacteria, our very distant and remote ancestors. Um, Milankovitch, how many people here have heard of Milutin Milankovitch. So I see one with Hugh. That's it. Barb can claim that only because she's had to sit to this talk a time or two. These versions of the past. Um, albedo is sort of this odd scientific term, which means reflectance. But for some reason, scientists are always coming up with terms, and this is one they come up with. For people who have ever taken a physics class, are you familiar with the concept of a black body? That would be a no, most likely. Okay. Well, this is also one of the important things to understand. So we have lots of things, so let's see if we can, uh, can get started here. These are some books I would recommend. Um, I had taken physics classes. I guess I had two years of physics by the time I was done, but that was probably close to 40 years ago. But then last fall, I took a climatology course online from the University of Chicago. Um, and the person teaching was David Archer. I can see my laser pointer is not going to work. Um, David Archer here in the center. And I brought this picture in part because I thought he was a dead ringer for Bob Good. And I, told Bob that, uh, and I, sent, I think I sent a copy of that picture. I don't know. It's always hard to see a resemblance to yourself, but I really uh, did. Uh, younger years. I was going to say, a younger version of Bob, but nonetheless, Bob is. Okay, these two are people I've not even heard before, but uh, I read The Global Warning by David Archer when I was taking the class. It turned, and this is a class you could take for free. It was pretty technical. It was a lot of fun. It turns out the figure in the literature is that even with a free class, only 7% of people make it through ruggedly all the way to the end. Well, I was part of the 7%. I made it through the end. I read concurrently this book by Rolly and Vega. Okay, and those are the dates that they were actually published. Um, you may have heard of this one, The Hockey Stake and the Climate Wars by Michael Mann. Michael Mann is one of the best known climatologists uh, now. Probably best known of all, though, would be Jim Henson, and he has a number of good books, uh, one of which is Storms of My Grandchildren. It's also quite technical, but it is a popularization of science. It is actually a very good book that I would recommend. I didn't, I didn't have space on the slides that included it at all. All right, we're going to start with this quote, partly because I've always loved this quote. And like a lot of people, I variously attributed this to either Mark Twain or Benjamin Disraeli, the former British Prime Minister. It turned out that Mark Twain was a popularizer of the quote, but Benjamin Disraeli, there was, there's no evidence that he ever actually said it. So historians have looked at this, found an Englishman by the name of Charles Wentworth Dilke, who probably was the, the person who came up with the definition of the three kinds of lies. So if he's remembered for nothing else, this is more than most of us will ever achieve, aside from our descendants in three or four generations. No one otherwise is going to remember any one of us, correct? No, there's not a place in history, unless one of you would like to raise your hand and claim that right now. But anyway, so Dilke is known for this quote. Now, that said, I would like to paraphrase this and add something to it, and that is, and graphs. And that's my graph right there. Notice it talks about a fourth kind of lie. And notice, this actually I think is pertinent. I'm going to have to move back and forth here a little. My laser is gone. Um, if I make a mistake, it's actually a very, a very minor importance. Mark, I hope you're watching. That's my wife back there. <laughs> yeah, if somebody else makes a mistake, that's much more significant. And I threw this in there to remind me to say that you should not wait until the end of this before raising questions or comments. Because as you know, there are no stupid questions. There are good questions, there are excellent questions, and very rarely, there are truly superb questions, which is what scientists like to deal with. Answers, on the other hand, are judged a little bit more harshly than that. I justify them so. All right, so that's the quote. So we start with a single figure here. How big is a square meter? Well, it's obviously a little more than a square yard. It's 39.37 or 35 inches, right? Mm -hmm. It goes about yay big. Okay? And it's, since it's square, it's actually equal to about one and a half square yards. 
you have to bear this in mind, that here's where it has its utility. And that is that the way climatologists look at the atmosphere, atmospheric scientists look at the atmosphere, they take an imaginary and visible sphere that covers the very top of the atmosphere around the entire globe. And what they do then is look at the energy coming in and out of each average square meter at the TOA, the top of the atmosphere. This is a very important basic concept in understanding climate science. That's the way this works. All right, now the problem is the amount of energy coming across is very small. That is the additional amount of energy that's being trapped. And I actually phrased that badly at the beginning of that sentence. It's not that there's more energy coming through into the atmosphere. The sun's output is actually quite stable, and we'll go into the details of that in a bit. But the amount of additional energy trapped from exiting the Earth is 2.29 watts per square meter. That seems like a very tiny, that's like a little Christmas light. That's a very tiny amount of energy. But there are a lot of square meters. In fact, there are 516 trillion of them at the top of the atmosphere. So that's a big number. So you multiply the two together, and you have crunched a number, and that's the number. And you can equate that, more or less, to the energy of four Hiroshima weapons, which is about 15 or 16 kilotons of dynamite, or TNT equivalent, um, per second. That's the amount of heat energy that's being added to the globe. And that's an easy number to remember. So do, do we have a sense of, of how big that number, 2.29 watts, is relative to the incident energy? Value? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked that question. That was a good question. We're not up to superb yet. That was a good question. Okay. All right. All right. I'll, I'll take the compliment right there. Okay. Well, all right. So here it is. That's my next slide. In almost every presentation I do, I do a number crunching slide. Because we all, in doing these sorts of talks, throw out lots of numbers. Not all of them are as important or as likely to be really accurate as others. So if you do nothing after discussion, after this discussion, but remember this set of numbers, you will be way ahead of the game and way ahead of, I think, the sort of the general population. So let's do this. First of all, let me show you this picture up here. Again, I'm going to point with laser pointer, but nothing will come out. You can see West Antarctica. That's the part in red. Because that actually is one of the parts of the world that is increasing in temperature faster than any other part. We all know it's about a degree centigrade. Everybody knows it's one degree centigrade. It's kind of the, the average increase in, in, in surface temperature of the globe. That's both terrestrial and marine, land and water. Um, but some parts are growing up faster. Now, that's not so much the surface of Antarctica. Antarctica is very cold. <coughs> Definitely sub-freezing. Any ice that is melting in Antarctica is being undermined from below. It's a change in currents and especially the warmth of the, uh, the waters that are coming underneath up to the grounding line, that last line with it where the ice field coming off the uh, glaciers is actually still touching the, touching the ground underwater. Okay, so what's happening is that there's a speed up of glaciers that are coming off that particular area, West Antarctica. Now, how can you call it West? South Pole's in the middle of Antarctica, right? Well, I'm assuming it's because it's in the Western Hemisphere. That part is arbitrary. The Northern and Southern Hemispheres are, are intuitively and immediately named. So we'll, 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 we will assume that that's part of the West, um, West Hemisphere. Now, we know also the Kyoto Protocol is an attempt to try and limit the temperature rise of the planet to two degrees centigrade. Instead of just, and, but not more than that. There are a number of reasons for this. And the Kyoto Protocol is actually a very important um, agreement. Um, the only thing comparable was the Kyoto Protocol of, I'm uh, not the Kyoto Protocol, um, but the one, the Montreal Protocol in 1987 that limited um, the right of nations to release uh, chlorofluorocarbons and related chemicals to protect the ozone layer. So that was an example of international cooperation that really worked well. The Kyoto Protocol, not so much, but there were over 170 signatories, signatories with our Senate, as you can imagine, we declined to sign the Kyoto Protocol, even though we're one of the two largest polluters in the world. And Canada and Russia signed, but have both since withdrawn because of their ongoing efforts to produce fossil fuels. But nonetheless, most countries in the world have signed this. There is sort of a, a universal or global consensus that we need to try and limit it under two. Now, it's not just that reason. We also think that above 2 degrees centigrade, average surface temperature rise, we start to see feedbacks to make it keep going up, even if CO2 does not rise further. Now, we know that the temperature rise is higher at the, at the, uh, more, the latitudes further away from the equator, so in both, in both the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, up about 2.5 degrees. While you guys were freezing this last winter, 
I don't know if you follow the news in Alaska, but they have much, much warmer temperatures than usual. And we know there was a circumpolar vortex that touched down in this area, and it was the um, cold continent, warm Arctic um, irony that may actually be part of the change in, in weather that we could expect to see. Now, so one degree centigrade, two and a half degrees centigrade, was there a question? Or just no, a stretch? No. Okay. Those may seem like strong numbers, but there's a really there's a really pertinent statement here. The mean global surface temperature, by best data that we have over the last four billion years, has all been within a range of 15 degrees centigrade, and it's 27 degrees Fahrenheit. Now it's not plus or minus 15; that's 15 top to bottom. So if you're making one or two degree change within that range of 15, then it starts to seem like something significant because we know the planet at times has been very very different than it is now. And in fact, that te these temperature changes seem so inconsequential and imperceptible to us because we see temperature changes in that range every day. You wake up and it's 50 degrees, and by late afternoon it's 80 degrees. That's a 30 degree Fahrenheit temperature change. So this seems like a small number, and it's easy for people to ridicule it and think that it's not serious. Question. Okay. Number one, I, I think that the uh, temperature uh, surface of Earth is, is uh, quite a bit above 1C now. I think it's uh, like 1.5 uh, math. That's the first point. The second is there's a lot of uh, argument and documentation that if we hit 2 degrees, we're, we're really hitting into major problems at 2, not 2.5. I understand that. What, I agree. What, what no, the, the one degree centigrade is, yeah. these are actually data that the, um, the IPCC is still using. That's what we had, 2011 temperature. Yeah. And I agree that it's a little bit higher on average. There's a lot of variation in, in uh, you know, there, there are more than 10,000 temperature stations around the globe, but there are not that many up in boreal areas. And that's where we were kind of underestimating temperature change for a while, because that part of the, the seeming hiatus and temperature rise, at least terrestrially, was because we weren't actually measured accurately in areas that are further north. Um, but I will grant you it's probably a little bit above one degree centigrade, but again, that's, if you look still at the IPCC, the more, most recent data, they're still basically using that. So we're in, the, we're in that range. And yes, it doesn't mean that two is an absolute decision point, and above two, things go haywire, below two, it's fine. Um, we know that Jim Hansen, for example, feels strongly that we should have stopped a, our CO2 at 350. And that, in turn, led to Bill McKibben and his organization 350 bucks. Dot org and so forth. Parts per million. And that's parts per million, yes. Should have mentioned that, yeah. When you think about it, that's a very tiny number. That's four hundredths of one percent of the atmosphere. Okay? Which makes it seem really tiny, which impresses some people, but actually it's a big number. All right. So the top of the atmosphere, T away, solar flux, is um, there's oh we're gonna cut up part of the slide here, because I can't get this further away from the screen than it is. Okay, so we know that just from intrinsic changes in, in the modulation of the flux from the sun, we can get about 0.1% change in the amount of energy entering each cubic meter up at the top of the atmosphere. We know also from orbital mechanics, from the way the Earth's orbit around the sun is changed, for example, by <coughs> gravitational effects of Jupiter and Saturn, that you can change a little bit the amount of energy coming to the planet in some ways subtly, in some ways more dramatically. But overall, the, the direct effect of one of those three, and we'll, we'll go into some detail, is about 0.2%. So the current number for the energy coming in at the top of the atmosphere is 1,366. So 1,366 is the number that we, that we are dealing with right now. And that's what we're trying not to influence further. That's watts per square meter? That's watts per square meter. That's uh, a power, so it's not over time. I mean, if it happens for an hour, then it's you know watt hours. That's watts. So that is basically 1.366 kilowatt. That's the power. Okay, that's what's coming in from the sun, but that's pretty much what has been coming in from the sun for a long, long time. Now, of, that, of the energy that comes in and hits the planet, we know that 30% of it gets bounced right out. Okay, it's bounced off by water, it's bounced off by land, it's bounced off by the cryosphere of all the snow and ice and so forth. So only 70% actually makes it down to, makes it down and stays on the surface and is absorbed. So again, so in that large number, 1366, the idea of adding 2.29 doesn't seem very significant yet, does it? But again, as I, made, as I commented before, the comparison is made to be about four Hiroshima weapon, weapons uh, per second in terms of uh, the amount of energy. Now the last number in this slide is that the fossil fuel reserves held by all the companies and all the countries on the surface of the, of the planet 
exceed or are equivalent to about five times the amount of carbon that anyone thinks that we can safely put into the atmosphere from this point on. So basically five times the amount. And I'll show you that calculation later on if we get that far in this flat set. So try and, and as a rhetorical question, can you think of any fossil fuel corporation, coal, natural gas, or oil, or any country that is planning not to go ahead and exploit its fossil fuel reserves to its fullest? I know you're trying in New York State. Wasn't well, Ecuador trying to, but then few, uh, other countries weren't willing to put forth the, the money? To I don't know specifically about Ecuador. I don't know there. There's an interesting president of Ecuador, as you no doubt know, um, Evo Morales. But I don't know what they specifically were trying. Do you know what they were doing? Um, I think that they were willing to keep carbon in the ground, but they wanted compensation being a low-income country. That does and sound that does totally we strike a yeah, so they were uh, like, yeah. all right. Yeah, <laughs> we're I understand. Take it out. Well, the point has been made, and, and it's a valid one, that while there's been a lot of discussion about carbon capture and sequestration underground for the various for CO2 produced by whatever means, um, not really much of that at all being done commercially. Aside from CO2 being given to oil drilling companies to try and keep their reservoirs pressurized. But basically it's not happening. So the best carbon capture and sequestration is just the lead of the gun in the first place. So to do that, obviously you would choose first those most dirty types of fuel. Tar sands in Alberta, practically next door, next door to us, is the first thing that comes to mind for me. But the Canadians at this point are very vocally um, saying that they're going to try and ramp up production of six million barrels of oil equivalent per day from the tar sands. And some of that tar sands oil, as well as some of the Bakken field oil um, in North Dakota, for example, are now coming into Bellingham, coming to the refinery that we have there. Now, we've had, not had one of the train explosions, but obviously there's been discussion locally about that risk. Okay, so if you understand that we haven't really discussed these much yet, if you understand the derivation of all these numbers, and you understand the implication of every number on the single number crunching slide, if we're all on that same page, we could stop right here and go out and have a couple of years. If you've got it all, we're done. But I think I need to probably do a little bit more exposition on some of these so there'll be a little so, clarification. So, so what I take away from this is that at 1366 watts per square meter and 2.29 additional watts per square meter influencing <coughs> global temperatures that much, that without that 2.29 watts per square meter, the, the Earth is in a very refined balance. In other words, here we, we have a very small, I and mean, it's a, that's a very, very small change. We call the, remember, the 1366, remember, 30% of that doesn't it's stay still, in the planet you, at all. Okay, so you start with 70% of that. Yes, it is very, very fine so It's a very small, it was it is very, it's a very fine yeah, and it takes very a very, very small amount right. of change to really have very large And we're going to talk about some of the times in geologic history where those changes have taken place. Yeah. Okay, which will be instructive in terms of potential. I didn't, I didn't realize it was that close to balance. Yeah, really yeah. very close. Okay, any other questions or comments about this particular slide? So one more, it's actually one more fact for you. That says, what I'm not going to do is regale you, with, for the most part, with any, any comments about millions or billions of tons of carbon entering the atmosphere. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is there seems to be a lot of variation in the validity of those numbers. They're constantly changing and they're often challengeable. The second is that it, it's really hard to emotionally grapple with a number larger than 100. We're, we're a base 10 people, and any number larger than 100 is really hard to, hard to comprehend. Um, so I'm going to give you a simpler number to, to remember. Here it is. If you take a gallon of what the British call petrol, what we call gasoline, it weighs 6.3 pounds. So imagine you run out of gas, you go to the station, you pick up, you get a one gallon can and ignore the tear weight of, the, of that can. So you have now 6.3 pounds of gasoline. It's almost all carbon. It's a hydrocarbon, right? Carbon is a much larger <coughs> atom than the hydrogen, which is you know, element number one. And so most of the weight of this carbon, in fact, it's five and a half pounds of carbon. And we know that what you're doing then is oxidizing, combusting, burning the gasoline, right? It's used as a fuel. And those are all the same thing. Those are all synonymous. So you're adding two oxygen atoms, which is element 16, to one carbon atom. This is where my laser would really nice to work. And therefore, CO2 is going to have 3.66 times the weight of incorporated carbon. Don't memorize these numbers. I don't have them memorized. That's why I put them on a the slide. So theoretically, your 500 pounds of carbon turn into 20 pounds of carbon dioxide. Except that, um, the actual yield is about 19.4. The rest of it turns into carbon monoxide itself, a greenhouse gas, also a potent biological poison. 
plus there's some incomplete combustion. So if you take that 6.3 pounds and triple it, that is the weight of CO2 you get. So it's a very simple number to remember, three. Every time you burn a gallon of gasoline in the tank of your vehicle, assuming you did not ride your bicycle tonight, <laughs> then you are putting thrice that weight, three times that amount of weight into the atmosphere. Yeah. Okay, so that's a number to remember. All the other stuff about gigatons of carbon, for the most part, will not be very useful. Now, natural gas, which has more hydrogen than, than does gasoline, um, emits less carbon dioxide because you're oxidizing both the hydrogen and the water, not very dangerous, right? And then the carbon and the carbon dioxide. So natural gas has about a quarter less CO2 produced. And we're going to ignore fugitive uh, methane uh, uh, losses from drilling and such. And then coal, about one third more, because coal is almost pure carbon. In fact, the highest rank of coal sometimes gets up about 97, 98% <coughs> carbon. So it turns almost totally into carbon dioxide. And even ignoring all of the, the trace contaminants like mercury and cobalt and lead and so forth, um, it just is going to be the most part of the truth. Okay, got that? So the number is three. Was that simple? All right, so let's do what the Germans call Ein Gedanken Experiment. Also, Ein Gedanken, uh, ein Gedanken der Such. And it just means a thought experiment. So we're going to do a thought experiment, and here it is. We know that there have been other other um, hominids besides us. There have been more than 20 species identified so far. If you go way back, Sahel Anthropos chadensis, obviously found in the country of Chad, okay, about 7 million years ago. That's the oldest one we have right now. If you get back to about 7.5 million, then we're talking about the split from chimpanzees and bonobos or bonobos. You get how it's pronounced. Okay, now about halfway along, you get to Australopithecus afarensis, right there. You know the famous Lucy skeleton? And Don Johansson, I think out of, out of UC Berkeley, and his team found that particular set of beautiful, beautifully preserved bones of just one young female. That's the Lucy skeleton that you probably heard about. Okay, and then obviously us, Homo sapiens. Now all these species were tropical and tribal, and we still are today. We're still tropical and tribal. We've shown lots of adaptive features, and we've been able to colonize all the continents, including Antarctica. So the question that I have for you, this is the thought exper experiment. In the last four and a half billion years, how much of the time would our ancestors, our ancestors from say 100,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago, how much of the time could they actually have survived on the planet? In other words, how much of the time has the planet, planet not been hostile to us? So let's see if we can figure that out. So we'll start here, the age of bombardment. So there was a large disk of the solar system forming. Gradually, a lot of mass accreted and formed the planet. And that was happening right during this time. It was very hot. There was a lot of volcanism. It turns out the majority of the atoms, the majority of the matter of the planet, was radioactive at that point. And then there's been a lot of slow and faster radioactive decay over time. That's still going on. If you look at geothermal power, something I'm a great fan of, Turns out about 20% of the heat in geothermal comes from this residual accretion and compaction of the planet. The other 80% comes from radioactive decay that's happening in the crust and mantle of the planet, slowly working its way toward the surface. So that was going on. The sun <coughs> was a lot dimmer, 20 to 25 to 30% dimmer than today. And the Earth rotated really fast, had about a 10 hour rotation time. So you can imagine how often you would have to wake up, go to work, come back, go sleep, do our So it would have been difficult. So this was not a good time for our hominids to come in and drop in. And you can see, okay, here's the other thing that happened, this spike right here. So not only was our planet turning into an actual mass, but there was a lot of debris out there in space, asteroids, comets, etc., also finally turning large. And these things were totally without a traffic cop, and so we got hit a lot. And all you have to do is look up at the moon on a night when there's a partial or full moon and see how many craters there are, just with the naked eye on the surface of the moon. Craters and craters and craters. The same thing happened to the Earth. There are about 175 known impact craters on our planet now, um, like the one just off um, Yucatan in Mexico. And it is felt that probably every square centimeter of the planet got hit at some time. So again, not a good time to be home, and ignoring the fact that there was zero oxygen, less than 1% oxygen in the air. So know that this was not a good time to be here. All right, the great oxidation event. 
So when life arose, which was pretty early, about three and a half billion years ago, that's the oldest good evidence which the metalite said they got the coast of Australia. So the action was very low, less than 1%, actually less than one tenth of 1% early on. And then again, we're talking again about 3.4 billion years ago. So the first organisms actually produced methane. Well, methane's a greenhouse gas, so they were already changing the atmosphere a little bit. But then the nickel, through geologic processes that I'm, that I'm not cognizant of, apparently got lower in the ocean, those dominant bacteria suffered. About the same time, cyanobacteria, used to be called blue-green algae. Remember, you were in high school and studied blue-green algae. Think of it as ponds come, okay? They came along, and they started producing oxygen. Now, there's a lot of biochemical detail that we're not going to go into that we have to hear. Once they started producing oxygen, until then, metal couldn't rust. Iron was soluble in water. It didn't rust. Instead, it just was stayed in solution. When the oxygen got up to about 2.5%, and of course, then, and both in the water and in the air, then these beautiful banded iron formations occurred that geologists love. And you can see they are very, very aesthetic. So that was very early on in the history of this planet that that was going. And the cyanobacteria continued to produce up to, finally got up to about a 10% level of oxygen. And that was a huge event for all the other prior microorganisms that were, that were there at the time. They did not tolerate this. This was, this was a sad thing for them. We didn't get to a present level of oxygen until about a, a one and a half billion years ago, and it didn't really stabilize until about a year, billion years ago. So again, for our happy traveling hominids in a time machine here, this is still not a good time to be around. Okay, cyanobacteria, say hi to your ancestors. There they are. All right, now we get further ahead. Since we're multicelled creatures, we tend to focus on multicelled creatures, right? And they're not just plants and animals, it's a little bit more complicated. They're kingdoms of plants. Protus to the flagellum, fungi, those mushrooms you had on your salad tonight, I hope. Um, archaeobacteria, eubacteria. Eubacteria are the ones that we think of, staph and strep and all those sorts of things. Archaeobacteria are often the extremophiles, um, say in the hot springs in Yosemite, that sort of thing. And then, of course, animals. Now, don't miss out to the really last universal common ancestor. I like that portrait there. Actually, it's even smaller. It's a single microscopic cell, right? But we know there was one because all these creatures of all types share the same DNA code. And that could not have happened by accident. That's a very complicated code. All right, now, so there was a time of chilling out, and that was this. Snowball Earth. This is a very realistic hypothesis that there was a time um, before 650 million years ago before there were any multicellular creatures, when the Earth actually turned into a snowball. I mean, really froze. Now, it may have been actually totally frozen on the surface, or it may have been that there was sort of a slushy area at the equator, so kind of a slush ball. But clearly, this took place. There are a lot of geologic features that are impossible to explain otherwise. Now, this is where I make the point again. The entire temperature range of the planet over the last 4 billion years was, was within a 15 degree centigrade range. Probably went down about five to six degrees for the last um, glacial period, but perhaps up five or six degrees centigrade to get to um, the time of the dinosaurs. And then look at this, the rebound, the hothouse earth. Literally, no ice at the poles, no snow anywhere. Um, crocodiles in Greenland and so forth. Okay, so extinction risk solved with multicellularity? No, sadly. So, yeah, I'm going to try and reorient this a little. So there have been, since multicellular life came about within the last 452, I'm sorry, 542 million years, there have been five major extinction events, and happily I'm only discussing two briefly. First one was the first, the number three rather, in the sequence right here, the red arrow. Um, 251 million years ago, just over a quarter billion years, sometimes called the Great Dying because 90 to 96 percent of all species died at that time. And it's not like the other 4 to 10 percent did well. They were really beaten down in numbers. So that was very close to being an extinction of all multicellular life. Things would have bounced back, but it would have taken another billion, a billion and a half years to get back to any cell life again, right? All right. So that was a great evolutionary significance. Um, there was probably a mass methane release. Um, the vertebrates, the dinosaurs, took about 30 million years to come back and start really making things happen again. The next one that's probably more familiar with people is the one that everybody knows about, 65 million years ago, except that's not quite right. It was a good paper last year in Nature, where they really nailed down the date as 66,038,000 plus or minus 11,000 years ago, 
is when that asteroid or, or comet, that boloid, um, hit just off the Yucatan Peninsula and killed off, again, over 50% by definition as a mass extinction, but about 75% extinction. So that was a bad one, also. And so, not just the non avian dinosaurs, of course, the, the theropod dinosaurs went on to become the birds we have now, but the plesiosaurs and mosasaurs, which I think were in the water, the pterosaurs like the pterodactyl, the ammonites. You probably have all seen fossils of ammonites before, right? And mammals and birds became the dominant land vertebrates, and that, of course, is where we belong. Uh, question. Yes. Where you're going. Yeah. Uh, on the, th the third great uh, Permian ter Permian. Jurassic uh, extinction, I understood that uh, the extinctions in the sea were worse than the yes. extinctions on the Yes, I had that understanding as well. What was that? You know? No, I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah. That's actually an excellent question. That's excellent. That's good. All right. So these are the two. Here and here. Now. So again, by a billion years ago, stable oxygen had 21% CO2 baseline. You can see, again, they're talking in this period of time now. They're finding, now these actually, the blue, the blue curve is the, uh, the CO2, I'm sorry, the red one is the CO2, and blue is oxygen. So you can see there's been a lot of variation in oxygen, so it got up, you know, well above the 21%, maybe even closer to the 30 for a period of time, which was a very great stress, because oxidative stress on animals at the time. And also a great risk for fires. It was very easy to burn things. All right. So now the concern is we have these geologically, biologically, paleontologically well-defined five major extinction events, ignoring the great oxidation crisis. Except now the concern is we're going to have a sixth one that this one, and this one is largely human induced. So a recent um, book and author. This actually I think came out this year, published this year. Part we're about to do this for our book club. And we've all watched the television show, so I keep on calling her Elizabeth Colbert. I think it's probably really Colbert, I don't know. Does anybody know how her name is actually pronounced? I'm assuming Colbert, I just don't know. I've read at least one of the book writers. She's a very fine writer, and she is what I would call, she, I would call her a science journalist. So she's basically a writer and journalist, but her back, and it may have a good background in science, but she's not actually a scientist herself. None of those writes very well, and this is another book that I would really recommend. All right, so here's just a quote from her book talking about amphibians, first of all, and the potential extinction rates. But then look at these numbers. So at risk, at risk, a third of all corals, a third of freshwater mollusks, a third of sharks and rays, mammals, reptiles, birds, obviously these are, these are large numbers. Now, contrast that with the first of the IPCC quotes that I'm going to put on a slide, that's this one, and their general scientific and appropriate conservatism. What they say basically is that they have a high degree of confidence that very few of the recent species extinctions are due to climate change. But that extinctions of species have happened with a kind of climate change at slower rates than it, that is going on right now in the past. And so they're basically saying, yes, there is a risk, but they also are making that cautious point that there's not much yet that can be attributed to climate change. Nice frog. I love that frog. <laughs> can volcanoes have a abrupt Abrupt impact. This is my rhetorical question. Anybody want to answer it? If we go to the next slide. Can obey? Yes. Somebody is, is not yet? Okay, there's an answer. All right. The answer is yes, of course. All right. So we're going to talk about the Toba super eruption catastrophe hypothesis. But there's a more recent historical correlate, and that was Mount Tambora. And that was in historical time. It was 1815, and it was also in Indonesia. And when that occurred, there was so much material ejected up into the atmosphere. That next, the next year, 1816, was described as the year without a summer. Remember that from studying history back in, in college or high school? The year without a summer. So they had snow in the middle of summer. They had crop failures that were very widespread. It was a significant event. But the Toba eruption, that was much bigger, more than 100 times bigger. So a huge amount of material was erupted again in Indonesia. And this happened about 73,000 years ago. Now, as a species, we've been around for about 150,000, you'll see various figures, up to 200,000 when you want us to call us a species. So about halfway through that period of time. So we got a 15 centimeter layer of ash over all of South Asia and all the surrounding water, and the material ejected up high to the stratosphere that stayed for a long time. In fact, from Greenland ice data, there's evidence that it was much colder for a thousand years, 10 centuries. And several tens of thousands of years later, there was a real dip in population of the hominids we had. There were still four, four groups of hominids on the planet. We were not the only one. 
So Neanderthals were certainly there. Neanderthals were the ones that went up into Europe, crossed over, over the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, got into Europe uh, tens of thousands of years earlier than Homo sapiens, but then later intermingled inter and interbred to some degree. So if you're of European extraction sitting here, realize you're about two, two and a half percent genetically a derivative of Neanderthals. Now, those that went in the opposite direction, they turned right instead of left as they were moving toward the North Pole, and they went um, eastward instead into Asia, into Oceania, the aboriginals of Australia. They have no Neanderthal genetic component. What they have is Denisovan, a much more recently described group. Now, so Homo floresiensis, if you know about that one, that was the first, the fourth one. They died off only about 12,000 years ago in Indonesia. Indonesia, I guess, is a real hot spot historically in a lot of ways. So only 12,000 years ago, we had a cousin, not one that we interbred with, but another, another hominid on the surface of the planet. You know, recorded history is what, about six, seven, eight thousand years? So not that much longer ago. There was another species on the planet, shorter than us, by the way. But what's really impressive is, okay, this is some tens of thousands of years, about 50,000 years ago, there was a point where by analyzing the genetic uh, makeup of humans, we were down to three to 10,000 individual specimens. Wow. That's a tiny number. And we have a town, Bellingham, where we live, 80,000. But that's like the small town of Linden next door. I don't know, do you have a town in the area with three to 10,000 people? On the entire planet, that's how many of us there were 50,000 years ago. That's why that was a genetic bottleneck. And that was a time of high risk where we could have just winked out. And you wouldn't have been here, nor would I. So, a very interesting history. So the planet is not as placid a place as you think. And, and, and that's due to the, the, the trouble. That's the hypothesis. But notice the, the timeline in between. It's over 20,000 years in right. between. Yeah, it's a long time. Yeah, that's a long time. Even though, again, it was a lot colder for 1,000 years. I mean, it may, I'm sure it was multifactorial. But just, again, doing the genetic analysis, you know, the, the molecular clocks and such, the mitochondria and so forth, it's really clear. So we actually are much less genetically varied than some of our uh, more distant cousins, like chimpanzees, they actually have a lot more genetic variation than we do, because they've been, they did not go through a bottleneck like this. Okay, when was the last ice age? And I'm warning you, this is a trick question, and you get five points for a gold star if you answer it right. When was the last ice age? Ended 10,000 years ago. Another idea. Younger Dryas? Next. 1600. Zero seconds ago. Oh. We're in an ice age. Oh. <laughs> the definition okay. of an ice Great. age is if you have persistent ice and snow on part of the planet. And we do. Okay, you've seen, you know, the glaciers, the, the ice caps, there's sea ice, etc. So if you have persistent, long-term, multi, multi, multi-year ice, multi-century ice and snow, you're in an ice age. Now, an ice age fluctuates. It has glacial periods when it's growing and interglacials when it's in between. So, ice age. Okay, now, we're talking about, again, just the last part of the geologic timeline, the four and a half billion years where the last 500 million, okay, the last fifth, really, and all these fascinating ages. So the Cambrian, when all the multi, multi the multicellular life really exploded. There were, there were multicellular creatures long before this. The actual so-called Cambrian explosion took place over about 10 million years. So it's not an instantaneous kind of thing. Um, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, everybody knows that. That's when most of the coal was, was formed, but not all. I mean, even as you say, it's 100 million years ago or less, a lot of coal was formed. There are no flowering plants at this time, by the way. So a lot of coal, a lot of oil and gas also formed there. All right, we talked about the end Permian extinction, 252 or 251 million years ago. I mean, in this one, remember, not 65. You can't tell your grandkids that the dinosaurs died off 65 million years ago because you're wrong. 66, 38,000 plus or minus 11. <laughs> By the way, so this is this is the Cretaceous, right? And you recognize that dinosaur. Well, there are others that are pretty much the same, but that's a T-Rex, right? Yeah. So that's when T-Rex died in the Cretaceous. So remember Michael Crichton in his book, Jurassic Park? Mm -hmm. Got that one wrong, didn't he? Mm -hmm. I guess Cretaceous Park didn't sound as good. <laughs> I will say, it kind of <laughs> flows better. It's a little more euphonic to call it Jurassic Park. <laughs> but anyway, it wasn't. That's when they died. Okay, so. I've had a very long-winded way of saying that hominids, like us, could not have survived on the surface of the planet to be generous really any time except, say, in the last 50 million years. We're talking about much less than one-tenth of one percent of the entire timeline of the planet. Okay? 
So, we see the obvious question. We won't go into the details of this, of this graph, basically. But it just shows the change in temperature over time, and it raises the obvious question, how can you know what the temperature was before there were th thermistors or thermometers? So here's one way. These are speleothems. This could be something like Carlsbad caverns. I can't remember right, where I actually got the picture. We all know the stalactites are on top. It has that third T in the middle. Stalagmites are on the bottom, right? <laughs> now, what happens is that you have minerals above, and water percolating through will slowly add um, laminate different layers over many, many years um, and slowly grow these exotic forms. You can then drill into them. And you can't use carbon-14 dating. Carbon-14 is only good for about 50,000 years. You have to use, uh, say, uranium chlorine ratios to get a very accurate date of each layer as you're drilling in. And then you can look at non-radioactive isotopes of carbon and non-radioactive isotopes of oxygen and find out what the temperature was at the time that was laid down. It's kind of too long of an explanation to go into. Talk to me afterwards. If you really want to ask, we can go in and back explain why that happened. But let's just take it for granted that you can look at isotopes of oxygen carbon and determine what the temperature was. Now, there are two situations where the water stops coming through with minerals to make these formations grow. One is if there's drought, and one is if there's a hard freeze. So if you have an ice age above, this stops growing. And if you have a long-term drought, again, nothing grows. But you can, you can time that. You can actually measure that in using the, uh, the radioisotope type data. So what could, and this will go back for about half a million years. Now, what can this teach us about permafrost? What exactly is permafrost? First of all, permafrost is incredibly common. If you look at the dark purple in particular, it's a quarter of the land surface of the planet. planet. One quarter. Look at Russia. Look at Canada. Look at Alaska. The dark purple is a really long-term permafrost. So there is a lot of this. And it holds a lot of carbon. And it holds, in fact, and I'm going to adjust this, about five times as much carbon as we currently have in the atmosphere. That would be our motivation to not let that escape and get it to the atmosphere. What, what, what form is it held in, uh, in uh, the permafrost? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. You're getting better? You're getting better. Oh. And it's held, it's held in several different forms. First of all, it's held in a deep freeze. I mean, we know there are, say, mastodons that have been frozen for 10,000 years or 15,000 years that very brave scientists have actually carved up, roasted, and eaten. So it's been in a really deep freeze. So that could be done. I know there's at least a couple of people like Emily here that would be willing to try that if she weren't vegetarian. <laughs> All right. The other form is actually hydrates. So terrestrial um, uh, methane hydrates or clathrates. Okay. And so you have both CO2 that can be released in the rotting, rotting uh, organic material, and then also methane, and then again methane from pla actual clathrates. Okay. okay, but they're all ultimately biologically derived, whereas methane clathrates are not. Okay. okay, so what's going, what the potential is that we have one of the long-term, one of the many long-term sinks for carbon right there in permafrost in that 25% of land that is frozen. Hmm. And we're by frozen, sometimes 600, 700 feet down frozen, despite the heat that's coming up from beneath. That's a really hard freeze, right? Now, I was talking a couple months ago to a friend of mine who had worked construction in Alaska, and he told me how they sometimes did buildings. Here's your dilemma. If you're, trying to put a, if you're trying to put a pile down to put a building on, and you pour concrete around it, well, we all know that concrete gets very hot for a while. Not super hot, but it stays quite, quite warm for a long time, for many days, as it's gradually setting. And if you put that in the permafrost, it's going to melt all the permafrost around it and start slumping a little. So what they often did was simply put together a slurry of mud, put the post in the ground, throw that in, and wait a couple days, let it freeze. Well, that was predicated on the assumption that things were going to stay frozen. And they're not. And so this is an example of structural failure, okay, where the whole foundation of that building is going is not, is not, is not doing well. And here's the term, the other term, drunken forest. So trees in areas that are sometimes frozen, sometimes less frozen, have put roots down, but basically at very stable ground, suddenly are in slush and they start leaning. Okay, so that's tough. All right, now again, an IPCC quote, and it's worthy of commenting on. So they have high confidence, which means 90 to 99, 90 to 99% confidence. Right? Um, that te the permafrost temperatures are increasing. Parts of northern Alaska, three degrees centigrade. Parts of Russia, two and a half degrees. So two degrees centigrade. Parts of Russia. So that's a potential problem. 
carbon sink that is turning into a carbon source if it melts below. Okay, so what are clathrates? You would raise the question. And here's the answer. Nice graphic there. You can see meth a methane molecule, okay? One carbon, four hydrogen. What happens is you'll have methane, natural gas, coming up from um, under the seabed. And it's coming up at maybe three or 400 degrees Fahrenheit. It hits that very cold ocean water and gets captured in a latticework of water. So that's what a methane hydrator is properly called. It has lots of names. So I think of this, the other one before was an underground planetary icebox. Okay, that was permafrost. Now marine, that is ocean methane clathrate, is an underwater planetary icebox. And what it's holding, in part, is the ice that burns, or methane hydrate, hydromethane, methane ice, or the most poetic one, fire ice. That's because you can take methane ice, flip a match on it, and it will burn until it's melted. Because it's releasing methane, it is 13.4% methane. And the Japanese currently, about 30 miles offshore, 1,000 feet deep, are doing pilot testing and trying to bring up methane hydrate, even under pressure, until they can get it to release into their apparatus and get methane out of it. Because as you know, they have essentially no fossil fuels. And a little bit worried about nuclear, with good reason to tell you now. All right. You'll see lots of numbers like this. It's very confusing about how potent methane is compared to carbon dioxide. Because methane in atmospheric chemistry breaks down a lot faster than CO2. CO2 can last for centuries up there. That's part of the dilemma. Um, so molecule for molecule, for molecule methane is actually more potent. It's up like 80-fold higher right at the beginning. But because it's going down, you can say that over the first century, Sometimes it's, it's listed as 20 times more potent, 22, 21, 36. I chose one that I saw in a couple places. Okay, so what about CO2? So let me introduce you to two more people, David and Ralph Keeling. David the father, Ralph the son, both atmospheric chemists um, out of UC San Diego. Um, David died a couple years ago, um, passed on the work. He was very, very meticulous in his scientific work. He was the one who really was the mainstay in developing the instrumentation to be able to accurately measure CO2 in the atmosphere. And the most famous site is one that Barbara and I almost visited one time on Mauna Loa in the Big Island. Partly because it's way up in the air, and partly because it's well away from everything. And there's no power plant nearby. I assume they don't let cars go up there and that sort of thing. Yes, you can. You can you drive can. right up to it. Yeah. Can you? Okay, you know, so you can get there. I got pictures. Next time we get there, I actually would, uh, would think about where to visit. Okay, so we started in 1958. And notice that nice curve. And here, going back. Now, I talked about the ice cores in Greenland. Ice, core, ice cores in Greenland go back about 650,000 years. You can measure it at all those different levels through all those years. You can measure the amount of dust, wind-blown dust. You can measure the amount of ash from volcanic eruptions. And it took them a while to figure out how to do this. But you can also measure, in little tiny bubbles, the amount of methane and the amount of carbon dioxide. So there's a lot of things you can do with this. So 650,000 years in Greenland, and at Vostok, the Russians were great craftsmen, and they managed to get down until they finally hit bedrock, and they have an 800,000 year time, 800,000 year history then of methane and CO2. And here it is, starting 800,000 years ago, and this is CO2. And you can see it bounced around in this range until, I'm not going to talk about that winter sport, it went up like that. All right, now, question for you. Oh, look at this, look at this. When you burn a fuel and you produce that CO2, okay, a certain amount of heat is released in doing so, right? But the amount of heat that's going to be trapped by that single molecule is 100,000 times more over the next few centuries. The amount that's going to trap on the surface of the planet, or trap in the atmosphere. Okay, so why the sawtooth pattern? Why does it go up like this? Deeply like that. It's a nice regular sawtooth, by the way. It's not really dramatic. The, the uh, seasons change. Exactly. Explain it then. What happens? Well, you know, in the, uh, in the winter, uh, right. the, uh, the albedo effect increases and the uh, absorption of CO2 decreases. Correct. Because of the yeah, so we're, we're constantly producing CO2, CO2. Um, all of our fossil fuel burden, and then volcanic eruption. So the CO2 is being produced all the time. Most of the land mass of the planet is in the northern hemisphere. And so what will happen um, at a time when um, summer comes along is a lot of green things start growing and most of the mass of a tree you know, actually is not out of the ground. It's from the CO2. And so it takes up a lot of CO2 to so drop down. So it turns out the annual high, though it bounces around day to day, month to month, is in about May. This is the month of May. I don't know what the measure is. You can, there are lots of places online you can go and, and see what the current uh, data are. And of course there are a lot of other monitoring places now besides, uh, besides the one in 
Hawaii, which, by the way, is hard up for money because, of course, it's losing some of its federal funding. Uh, you see uh, San Diego is trying to keep it going up. All right, so now that we talked about potential carbon sources, carbon sinks that could turn into sources, we've talked about methane clathrates, we've talked about permafrost. These are two of the reasons why we're really worried about going past the two degrees centigrade volumes. Because then you start getting positive feedback. It becomes a non-linear thing. You could stop adding CO2 and the melting methane clathrates and the melting permafrost can make that CO2 continue to go up. So you get to a certain point where it's self-governing. It just keeps going. Yes? Can you describe a little bit about the difference between the carbon-12 and carbon-13, or did you do that already and I missed it? We can't. No, I didn't. I have not done that. It's the same with oxygen-16 oxygen, um, uh, oxygen, uh, and oxygen-18. The different isotopes have different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus, and so carbon-13 is going to be a little bit heavier than carbon-12, just a tiny little bit. Yeah. And, and obviously oxygen-18 is going to be a little bit heavier than, than uh, oxygen-16. So if you incorporate those, say, into a water molecule, in warmer conditions, it's easier to melt, to evaporate both of those, and they could continue to be, um, they could continue to be a vapor in the atmosphere, and then rain out much later, precipitate out much later. Because of circulation in the atmosphere, they can finally get to a place that's pretty far north, and then be precipitated and leave a record in the ice. Now, there probably was a really excellent ice record somewhere in Florida sometime, but obviously there's no ice there now. There's no multi-year ice anywhere there now. So basically it just makes for a heavier molecule. In colder conditions, then a molecule of water that's heavier will tend to precipitate out earlier, and then you get a higher ratio of molecules of water with oxygen um, 16 and with carbon 12 that end up, or not of water, but uh, you, you, get, you get different uh, amounts of, uh, of, of water in higher in the uh, um, O16, the oxygen 16, that ends up in the ice record. So by looking at that variable ratio of those two, you can, you can determine how cold it was at the time that was laid down 200,000 years ago. But, but isn't carbon-13 more unstable than carbon-12, and as a result, it's more likely to combine with hydrogen atoms for me? Not that, not that I know of. I would be happy to be stand, to stand corrected. It's not really back to the way carbon-14 is with a half-life of, I think it's 5,270 years or so. Um, but I think they're both basically non radioactive I think it's just that it makes for a heavier molecule of carbon dioxide. But feel free to get back to me if you give us more data. All right, so again, the concern about these two areas is positive feedback. Now,